Malawi's former president that Dr. Joyce Bunda is currently delivering a public lecture on women and leadership in Africa at the Nelson Mandela University in Port Elizabeth. Let's take you live there now. The Pan-Africanism. I don't know whether I can do that in 35 minutes, but I'll try. But I decided that first I'm very truly grateful to the Nelson Mandela University for inviting me. But secondly, because of the name that you bear, I decided that I should say, my, I talk about my encounter with the greatest Pan-Africanist that I know that happens to be Nelson Mandela. It was in 1995 when my president, Dr. Bakir Munuz, was invited here for a state visit. And President Mandela was still president. And the special request from my president was that uh, he wanted to visit Robben Island. And so we ended up at Robin Island. And the day that I went into that little cell, the two by two cell, and imagined somebody in that room for 27 years and came out and with no bitterness and forgave all that kept him there for 27 years, it impacted on my life and on my journey like you cannot imagine. And from that day onwards, my quest was one, to meet him face to face, and number two, to meet Winnie Mandela face to face. Because for me, they are both heroes. So, Grace Machero is a very good friend of mine. And so I told her, she must ensure that once in my lifetime, I must meet Nelson Mandela. I was then Vice President of the Republic of Malawi, and I traveled to South Africa, and I called Grasa, and I told her, I'm in town. I need to meet this great man. <laughs> and she invited me to her house in Johannesburg. And when you get to that house, those of you who have been there, you face the building, you go into the house, there's a long corridor, and there's a room at the end. And as somebody was taking me in, Grasa was sitting, was standing in the room, and beckoning me. And so, she, this is a good friend of mine, I'm running to, to get to her, hug her, in my mind, that's the room she'll sit me, and go and get him, or we shall, we shall rest, and go to the room where I'll meet my hero. So I ran into that room and I hug her, and what I didn't know, he was sitting right in that room. <laughs> and she turned and showed me where he was sitting, and instead of running to him, I ran for the door. <laughs> When President Mandela died, it was my greatest privilege and honor to be the speaker at that funeral in my capacity as chair of SADC. <laughs> and those of you who have watched that clip will know, will see that I speak about this encounter as well. And the photograph that I have on the wall in my house is where I'm running for the door and Grasa is grabbing me to take me back to Madiba. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, so in tackling this subject, I wanted to start with President Mandela. I'm talking about um, Pan-Africanism. I have been my country's foreign minister. I saw the discussions of a, a, a larger part of who between 2006 to 2009, when I was foreign minister, was when uh, our brother leader, Gaddafi, was still alive and talking about Africa becoming one country. I have very interesting experiences and comments from that period. So from the onset, I must admit, though conceptually, Pan-Africanism remains a contested concept as there is no single universally accepted definition of the concept owing to the dynamism, fluidity, and dimensionalism. Simple put, it is a concept that is not too many faces. There, therefore, the best way to define and understand is to focus on its origin, what it entails, and what it seeks to achieve. 
Pan-Africanism traces its origin to the, in the struggle of the African people against slavery and colonialism. It is both a movement and an ideology centered on the belief that people of African descent, both at home and in the diaspora, share a common and past destiny. This shared common past and destiny, therefore, informs how people of African descent, both at home and in the diaspora, mobilize against racial discrimination, colonialism, and economic, political, social, and cultural oppression and exploitation. One, it confronts the Western domination and exploitation of Africa and its vast resources. Number two, it gives global Africans the platform, voice, courage, and resources to improve their political, social, and economic lot. Number three, to enrich and empower global Africans to take their rightful place in the global system. And finally, to achieve one of the central tenets of the major religions, that all men are created equal and are not to be exploited, subjugated, and dismissed. Fourth, an African whose development is people-driven, relying on the potential offered by African people, especially its women and youth, and caring for its children. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, our aspirations as stated area, which have been adopted by many of our regional blocks, including SADC, are deeply rooted in the Pan-Africanism ideology. Therefore, realization of such aspirations greatly depends on how true we remain to the ideals and values of Pan-Africanism. And secondly, how much we utilize the opportunities that are there on the continent and elsewhere. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, this takes me to the question that this paper seeks to address. That is, what opportunities are there in Southern Africa for advancing Pan-Africanist agenda? To begin with, at the heart of Pan-Africanism is the issue of unity and inclusivity. As we all know, one of the major features and legacy of colonial regime in Africa was an Africa that was heavily fractured and divided. Such divisions emanated from pure greed among Western powers as they scrambled for our Africa resources. This division manifested in its not only among countries and, relig and regions, but also among ethnic as well as racial groups. To make matters worse, Europe's arbitrary post-colonial borders left Africans bunched in two countries that did not represent their heritage, and this did not make sense at all. What is more, such an act constitutes the genesis of many problems that Africa is facing today, including ethnic con con conflicts. This reminds me of what one British prime minister once said regarding setting, setting up of African post-colonial borders. He said, and I quote, we have been giving away mountains and rivers and lakes to each other, only hindered by the small impediment that we never knew exactly where the mountain and the river and the lakes were. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, we have heard stories, those of our, our age, of when they were dividing up our continent. There was a party somewhere where two uh, colonialist countries were having a party, and there were other ladies said, but I don't have a mountain. And the other one said, well, have you got a pen? And just pushed another mountain to the other side. So that country has a mountain that originally did not belong to it. I don't want to mention names. I don't want to start World War III. But that's how ridiculous it is. You find that in places like Malawi, on the border in Chipata side, a bedroom is in Zambia, a sitting room is in Malawi. <laughs> and they divided villages and families. Sadly, this is a reality that still haunts and troubles Africa to this day. This scenario and reality meant that 
and still means one thing to post-colonial African leaders. That is to bring unity in Africa and um, among Africans. There was and there still is a shared feeling among African leaders and Africans that the only way Africa can attain its rightful place on the global stage is to have Africa that is united and inclusive in all respects. Africa that speaks with one voice. Africa that is inclusive and integrated. Africa that remains in charge and in full control of its destiny. Africa that defines what is good for it. Africa that has total control and say over its affairs and resources. And to remind my fellow African leaders that the resources in our countries don't belong to us, they belong to the people, not our pockets. <laughs> what doesn't make sense to me is that uh, when they split us into little, little places, we are still supposed to be uh, sovereign states. So Malawi and China as partners, India and the Eswatini, Swaziland, how do they expect us to negotiate meaningfully? Yes. Such shared conviction and desire among people of Africa for one people one continent and one Africa is one huge opportunity, in my opinion, that we have if our much cherished Pan Africanist agenda and dream, uh, dreams are to be realized. Yes, it is the very same shared sentiment, conviction, and desire that saw the establishment of organizations of African unity, now African Union, and the many regional and sub regional blocks that we have on this continent, including our own SADC and COMESA. So when we talk about opportunities for advancing Pan-Africanism, we first have to focus on attitude, the desire and conviction among people of Africa regarding their plight and future and of their continent. Such collective and shared sentiments and convictions and desire chance us as Africans to build a united, stable, prosperous and inclusive Africa an Africa that is economically, politically, and culturally liberated, an Africa that belongs to Africans, an Africa that takes care of its entire people regardless of gender, age, color, or race, or tribal identity and minimal grounds. There is this saying where I come from, which says mind is a powerful foundation. This simply means that what is built in our mind lasts. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, having looked at collective and shared conviction and desire among Africans for a united, inclusive, and prosperous Africa as a key opportunity for advancing Pan-Africanist agenda, let me now turn to institutional and policy opportunities that we have as a region for advancing inclusive Pan-Africanism agenda in Southern Africa. Suffice to mention here that under institutional and uh, policy opportunities, there are a number of factors that we can look at. However, in the interest of time, I will fo focus primarily on three key factors, namely trade and economic integration, infrastructure, and education. Since emancipating itself from colonial, from colonial control, Africa has realized that true emancipation will only be attained through economic development. Accordingly, as a continent and as a region, we fully realize and know that it is only through trade and not through aid that we can attain tangible and sustainable economic growth and development. <laughs> Africa further realizes that meaningful and sustainable economic growth and development are only achievable through deep economic integration and continental as well as at regional levels. Such realization was key in the establishment of the Southern Africa Development Community and many other regional, sub-regional blocks across the continent. While Africa journeys to find its rightful place in the world system, South, Southern Africa journeys to find its rightful place in Africa's economic systems. 
a development that necessitated the adoption of deep economic integration among countries in the region with a view to attain meaningful, inclusive, and sustainable economic growth and development and accelerate poverty eradication. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, at the heart of deepening economic integration is creation of a free trade area in the region. Free trade area, apart from providing a big market for the local industries in the region, is also important in increasing domestic production and creating greater business opportunities, higher regional imports and exports, among other benefits. We recall at the heart of Pan-Africanism is economic empowerment. Thus, we, as we talk about SADC's economic integration, we are not only talking about a structure or mechanism for advancing Pan-Africanism, but we are also talking about a huge opportunity for advancing gender-sensitive Pan-Africanism. We ought to realize here that the success of SADC in attainment of deep economic integration largely depends on inclusive, inc inclusive policies. Therefore, how successful the SADC economic integration drive is and will be largely depends on how much space women are accorded in the whole process, both as players and benefic beneficiaries. I'm talking about women as major players. And I'm not talking about microfinance because women, we are not micro. <laughs> we want to be key players in our businesses in our region. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, yes, it is a matter of common sense that any meaningful economic emancipation and development that Pan-Africanism seeks to achieve will only be attained and achieved when women who constitute 53% of the regional population are fully integrated into national and regional economies, both as equal actors and beneficiaries. I'm talking about 53%. We are the majority. And we cannot be ignored. But by the way, we also brought the other half into this world. Yes. So the principle should be nothing about us without us. We need to be sitting at the table at the policy formulating tables. And if we don't find our way there, we shall remain on the menu. If we don't find our way to the dinner table, we shall remain on the menu. When we were in Beijing, we agreed that we were going to get back home and find our way to leadership positions. And I remember somebody asking Gertrude Mangela, how do we get to the leadership positions? Because men are already sitting there. And she said to us, well, push them if you have to, but get there. <laughs> Number two is infrastructure. As the core of economic development and deepening economic integration is infrastructure development. As a region, Southern Africa includes large states with large economies, small, isolated economies, island states, and a mix of low and medium income economies. Against this background, SADC as a regional bloc has placed development of national and regional infrastructure as one of its priority areas. SADC's efforts to develop national and regional infrastructure is aimed at creating a large market and a greater economic opportunity and promotion and sustaining regional economic development, trade and development. Simply put, infrastructure development is critical in unlocking national and regional potential and boosting trade at national, regional, and continental global levels. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, at the heart of our regional economic integration are improved transport and communication infrastructure, among others. Therefore, infrastructure development program which includes road, water, and air transport, ICT, and communication, energy, among others, pursued by SADC as a regional body to facilitate deepening of regional inter uh, economic integration, provides not only a potent mechanism 
for advancing Pan-Africanist agenda, but also provides a huge opportunity and catalyst for women's integration in the regional and continental economies. Third is education. I dare say this is where it all starts with regard to advancing an inclusive and gender-sensitive Pan-African agenda. As espoused in the SADC aspirations, Southern Africa as a region recognizes the pivotal role that education plays in improving and der driving economic growth and development, alleviating poverty and enhancing quality of our people's lives. Yes, education remains central in realizing the region's vision, a common future. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it is pleasing though to note that considerable strides have been made in the region with countries committing themselves to increased investment in education and to education for all protocol. Countries in the region recognize that improving access to quality education is an important strategy to uh, realizing education for all goals and targets. Regional statistics from SADC show good progress in the education sector in the region, especially in the following areas. School infrastructure development, enrollment rates, and availability of qualified teachers, among other parameters. And as already alluded, alluded to in this paper, Pan-Africanism is primarily about liberation and empowerment of Africa and its people, including those with African heritage elsewhere. Yes, it is about ensuring economic well-being, improved standards of living and quality life, freedom, social justice, peace, and security among Africans. No tool is as effective as education in attainment of all these. Therefore, much as education remains a potent mechanism for delivering on the aspirations and ideals of Pan-Africans, education equally presents a whole range of opportunities for advancing the many aspects and ideals of an inclusive Pan-Africanism agenda. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, having looked at the opportunities that the above areas provide in advancing Pan-Africanism agenda, allow me to flip the coin to appreciate what lies on the other side of these opportunities. I am talking about looking at impediments that lie within the four opportunities on advancing an inclusive Pan-Africanist agenda that I have shared with you earlier. To begin with, yes, I alluded to the fact that shared conviction, determination, and desire among Africans for a united and politically, culturally, and economically emancipated Africa constitute a solid opportunity that we have as a continent to advance much cherished Pan-Africanism agenda. Sadly, despite its early positive triumphs and jury, the jury is still out as the much desired unity remains elusive in many parts of Africa and among many Africans. Africa remains agonizingly fractured as the rise of subnationalism and ethno nationalism within Africa and beyond seems to render Pan-Africanism irrelevant. Yes, as rightly observed by Sebela Abide in 2008, the Africa that was supposed to be the maker of Africans and people of African descent, somehow that Africa now has become a killing and chaotic field. My heart bleeds to see what is happening in many countries in West Africa, where religious and ethnic conflicts have become the order of the day. Africa has become synonymous with poor governance, corruption, civil wars, and ethnic conflicts, poverty and disease, and also show source of social vices. Yes, Pan-Africanism was meant to liberate Africans at home and in the diaspora from colonial oppression and exploitation by colonial Europe. However, as rightly observed by Abidi, the question we have before us, who is going 
to liberate the common African from the pre pre predatory and exploitative policies of their own governments and elites. Who? <laughs> from a gender perspective, the question is, where does this situation leave the African woman and that of the girl child? Who is going to protect the African woman and the girl child from the pangs of civil wars, sexual exploitation, poverty, retrogressive and abusive cultural practices? Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I have been a head of state. Corruption is robbing us of the very best to uplift the lives of women and children. The tragedy is that those that fight corruption, at the end of the day, they become victims and not victors. <laughs> you find that there's now a, cro a good crop of African leaders fighting corruption. You go to Malawi in 53 years. The only president that came and he tried to fight corruption and arrested 72 thieves was Joyce Banner. Why? Because I believe that leadership is a love affair. You must fall in love with the people you serve and the people must fall in love with you. Yes. And if you claim to love the people, you will not want anybody to exploit them or to steal from them. Yes. But I want you to know that it is not deliberate that most leaders shy away from fighting corruption because of the price those that dare pay. Yeah. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, if you Google me, you will not think I'm the one who arrested 72 thieves, but I'm the fifth myself. Yeah. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, just look at what President Ramaphosa is going through just by fighting, fighting corruption. Look at what President Uhuru Kenyatta is going through just by fighting corruption. What you are doing is fighting very powerful people. And what they do, they fight you back. In my case, they told me, yes, we have stolen, but if you ever dare to arrest us, we shall smear this back onto you. And nobody will know who stole and who didn't steal. I am married to one of the finest lawyers in Malawi. And he told me. <laughs> and he told me, if you haven't stolen, Go ahead and arrest them and let them smear it onto you all they want. At the end of the day, it will be about evidence. Yes. So I went ahead and arrested 72 people, and some of them are still serving time. And even dissolved my own cabinet and sent some of them to jail. So now I sit back and watch my fellow presidents who are making any effort and what they are going through. Some people will just say it's not worth it and let, let them steal from one another. Yeah. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, when all is said and done, the question remains, where does all this leave the much cherished Pan-Africanist agenda? Yes, the desire for economic emancipation and development, inclusivity, unity, and prosperity among Africans. Trade and economic integration as a policy opportunity for advancing Pan-African agenda Despite its numerous expected benefits, which include the prospects for opening up national, regional, and continental economies to women through its various mechanisms, implementation of SADC economic integration agenda remains at snail pace. Ratification and actual implementation of the Africa protocols and programs that are meant to guide the process of deepening regional uh, economic integration remain painfully slow to the point. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, tracking progress on the African Regional Integration Index, which captures SADC's integration in five key dimensions, namely trade integration, regional infrastructure, productive integration, free movement of the people, and financial and macroeconomic integration shows worrying progress on the regional economic integration drive. Except for South Africa, Botswana, Namibia and Zambia, the rest of the continent's performance remain a matter of grave concern. 
All these less satisfactory performance among countries in the region are largely as a result of failure to implement relevant protocols and other obligations. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, infrastructure development, the challenge in this institutional factor to advancing inclusive and African agenda lies in the implementation of infrastructure development program by member states. As Elia pointed out, one of the five dimensions of SADC's economic integration is development of national and regional infrastructure. Performance of SADC member states in this dimension shows less satisfactory scores, except for South Africa and Botswana. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, sadly, SADC's failure to implement infrastructure development programs mirrors the situation at continental level. One continental infrastructure development program that quickly comes to my mind is the Cape to Cairo Road Infrastructure Program. Much as the program features highly in the African Union Agenda 2063, this is a road infrastructure initiative that we have been hearing about for four decades, but very little, with very little done. Turning to education as an institutional policy opportunity for advancing inclusive and Africanist agenda, much as considerable progress has been made in the region with regard to developing the sector, such strides are more or less minimal. When we are talking about supply, the supply side, I'm talking about governments trying to build schools, train teachers, buy school equipment, is even better than the demand side in some of our societies. There's so much standing in the way of the girl child to go to school in some countries. The international community has wisely decided to support Africa with um, huge resources for the adolescent girl child. But as an African woman, it is between zero and 10 where we are losing the girl child. We need to focus on what is happening to that girl child in that age group. I have written extensively about this, and that's why I saved at the uh, Woodrow Wilson Center and Center for Global Development. What, has, what I bumped into accidentally is the scientific fact that leaders are born. And they say they are not born with 100% leadership traits, but only 30% and 70% has to be added on by society. Sending that girl child to school, sending that girl child to university, personal development and mentoring. But distinguished ladies and gentlemen, there are countries in this Africa where 85% of the people are rural-based. And this girl child who may have been born with 30% leadership traits is locked up in a household of abject poverty and she will never go to school. It is Africa that is losing. The point I'm trying to advance, that is, I have advanced in the book, Zero to Ten, where I talk about what is going on in the life of this girl child between zero to 10, that may stand in the way of exploiting the 30%, and then Africa stands to lose. I have written a book about what's going on between zero and 10. By 10 years old, this African girl child has already been mutilated and has already been initiated and has already been defiled. There's no way she's going anywhere. It is the duty of this department. And I liked the speeches that took place here. Maybe we could look at zero to 10 as another area of focus. If we are going to we yield more from the education of our women to become the leaders we want them to be. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, so what I am saying, the environment at household level and the wider society is the genesis of the problem of constrained access to education for the girl child. Therefore, as a region, much as education saves us well in advancing inclusive and gender-balanced pan-Africanism, much more would be achieved if, the, if, this regard, if we, in this regard if we could pay particular attention to the many institutional policy and cultural challenges that are there 
in the education sector and society as a whole, which reduce the effectiveness of education as a tool for advancing an inclusive and gender-friendly pan-Africanism and attainment of women's emancipation and empowerment. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it is common knowledge that the journey to realize the ideals of pan-Africanism, which inform the aspirations of our continent and regional bodies, remain a challenge. Yes, we do acknowledge that some progress has been made on this journey. But I feel as a region and as a continent, we could do better. Yes, much more with regards to achieving an inclusive society where women will occupy their rightful place and play their rightful role in our society and in its systems. Critical to all this, among other factors, is women's leadership. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, we are the Sadiq region. And in 1997, Sadiq, our heads of state, signed the gender protocol, the 1997 gender protocol. What is it? That was 1997. Have we achieved the 50 50 parity? Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, but there are very encouraging developments in our region, all the same and our continent with regard to women leadership. And among full participation, and, and, uh, and their full participation in decision making. To this end, let me salute President Ramaphosa for appointing 50% of his cabinet to be women. If only... <laughs> so Rwanda has done the same Ethiopia has done the same. Maybe we need to start naming and shaming because especially in our region, it is our own protocol that said we should be 50-50 at all levels. Let me share a lighter moment. You know, there were so many meetings, numerous meetings. Brother Leader wanted to take us on the path of one Africa that was one country. And I don't know whether he wanted to be the first president of that country. <laughs> but then we had very serious discussions. I, I was foreign minister. We traveled to South Africa. We had a conference in Durban and we discussed how this would be actualized. And I remember the foreign minister, Dramin of Swaziland, who was listening seriously. And then he raised his hand. And he said, well, then what's going to happen to my king and my kingdom? <laughs> what about my king? When you're talking about one country, I have a kingdom next door. And I said, yes, what about Malawi? My great Malawi and my president. Perhaps where Africa should be aiming to go is the, a model like the European Union. But for us to ever hope that we shall achieve one country, that may never happen. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, what are the attributes of women leaders? As I conclude, what does it feel like to be a woman leader, to be a president? I believe that women leaders take risks. And I believe that women leaders go into state house to serve and not to rule. That I have seen my male counterparts who have gone to state house for the power. And when they get there, they will do all it takes to stay there. Because there's power there. And I know there is because I've been there. But when you are a woman, you go into that state house to serve. And you realize from day one that I have to do it right because there's life beyond state house. Here I am at Nelson Mandela University. I'm not a president. So you don't go and sacrifice the people that you're supposed to serve because you don't want to leave state house. <laughs> and those that stay in state house and refuse to leave, I ask my husband, are they in the same job I was? Because if you've gone there to self, it's a 24-hour job. And when you are done, 
you are prepared to leave and give space to others to lead as well. <laughs> Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the best attribute of a leader, good leader, is the team they put together. The realization on the part of a leader that they don't, they don't know it all, that other people know better than them. And so I, better, I always prepared to put together a good team and listen to them and take advice. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I want to share what I understand as feminism. I'm talking to younger women who are watching social media and international media and have already got here in their mind what it is, what it means, what, it, what it, women's rights mean, what feminism means. I was in America and the, the African Union ambassador who has lost her job because of being efficient, Arikana Chihombori, organized an event for me and Ellen Selif and invited, invited distinguished guests like you are here. And one lady at the back raised her hand and said, Joyce Panda, tell me, tell me what I need to do. I have lived here in America. My, I come from Nigeria. I've lived in Amer here in America for many years. But that every time I go back to Nigeria, I gather my fellow women of my age and say, let's fight. Let's confront these men. Let's ask for our rights. It is our time. But they don't seem to listen. So I said, well, that's what my response was, or oh, that's what you have learned in America. Let's look at America. Africa has had five female presidents. America is still trying to get one woman in two state house. <laughs> America has not yet achieved equal pay for equal work. America has only got 18%, I think they're about, in their House of Representatives. We have, on this continent, a country with 63% of women in Parliament, the highest in the world. What I want to suggest to you is that there must be something we are doing right. Because if you go into those countries, you didn't confront President Ramaphosa for him to, to appoint 50%. Women of both, uh, uh, Rwanda did not confront President Kagame, but there must be something we are doing right, and the world can learn from us, one step at a time. It's not about confrontation and yelling and marching that will bring that about. It's our negotiating skill that we are born with as women. When I got married to Richard Banda, he was a high court judge. I was right at the bottom. I didn't tell them, him to say, listen, uh, uh, there at the top, you are equal to me. Because he could have just laughed at me. I found my way up there. One step at a time. It is me that worked on me. It is you that must work on you. <laughs> By the time this gentleman realized I was first, I was the president, head of state, and he was first gentleman. <laughs> Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I want to leave this with you. It was in 19, 2013, 2012, 2013, I was the first woman to chair SADC. I want to leave this with you so you can have hope. I was chairing SADC the first time a woman chaired SADC. So my 15 brothers, presidents in the SADC region, came to Malawi because you host a summit when you are, head of, when you are chairing. It was a, the year uh, Executive Secretary Salamau at the SADC headquarters was retiring. And I told him, I said, well, while I'm in office, we shall get a woman. Get a woman for the first time as executive secretary. And they went looking and they found Dr. Tax from Tanzania. The power that I had as president, I used it to appoint fellow women. So the chief, chief justice in Malawi for the first time was a woman. The solicitor general was a woman. Seven district commissioners. The deputy inspector general of police. 
the statute of SADC requires that when somebody becomes executive secretary, they take oath in the country where the summit is taking place. So Dr. Tax traveled to Malawi. So I was standing at the podium. My, all my brothers were there behind me. And I called Dr. Tax to the podium to take oath. And it requires that the chief justice of the country shall preside over that oath. And the Dr. Anastasia Sosa was serving as the first female chief justice of my country, appointed by me. She walked to the podium to preside over this um, oath. But it, it also requires that the chair of African Union must oversee this process. And Kosaza Nazuma was in the room. <laughs> Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it was the greatest day of my life that my 15 brothers sat there and watched women <laughs> conduct serious business. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, we are not a hopeless case. We can do it, and we shall get there. May God bless you.